So we are beginning our interview with uh, Mr. Peter Monk. Um, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McRae. And we are currently in uh, Ottawa at the Mining Association of Canada. So to begin, uh, could you please state your full name? I'm Peter Monk. And uh, your date of birth? November in uh, 1927. And uh, where exactly were you born? In Budapest, Hungary. And uh, as, a, as a young child, what did your uh, parents do? Well, my parents were divorced when I was one year old. So I had a mother and a father, never really had parents, per se. Um, and, you know, the war came uh, pretty quickly. I was 12 years old and I went to school and my father was an oil company executive. I think he worked for Shell. He wasn't uh, very prominent or competent or brilliant person. He, he liked a pleasant life. Uh, he had a wealthy father who I think looked after him several times. He'd gone through a number of marriages. Uh, and uh, as I said, um, my mother uh, did not have a job in those days. Ladies didn't really work. And she uh, had a good time in life and enjoyed traveling and that's all I remember. And then came the war, which changed absolutely everything. Um, and we also had the bad luck of being Jewish. And then, of course, pretty soon the Germans came in and that changed everything in a very negative way. So that's what all there is. And then my grandfather took us all to Switzerland, where I spent uh, the bulk of the war years until I came to Canada. Do you remember what year you moved to Switzerland? I or sure do. <laughs> I, uh, I left Hungary and moved to Switzerland in 44. Okay. So still, and I uh, came to Canada in 47. Okay. Still, uh, you were in Hungary for a good portion of the war. I, I was, but remember, Hungary was neutral. Mm -hmm up until they were occupied by the Germans sometimes in the spring of 44. Okay. And pretty soon after that, the Germans started to commit atrocities. My grandfather organized his kids, except the one he had two living in Canada, to be taken to Switzerland. And so that's where I spent the rest of the war until my uncle from Canada could come over and organize my uh, my visa and permission to come to Canada. Okay. So 1947, you. Were, some, my you big luck, my my lucky break. Yeah. <laughs> you moved officially to Canada. Officially, very officially, yeah, with a visa. Yeah. yeah. Right on. You couldn't in those days come without a visa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. couldn't swim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, then you uh, you went to school in Canada. I went to I redid, we had to redo my high school. Okay. At Toronto, uh, my metri uh, my city matric at Lawrence Park in forty eight, and then I went to U of T mm -hmm. uh, in the fall of forty eight. In uh, what uh, department? Engineering SPS, and I graduated in fifty three. Okay, and as a why why engineering? I guess my, 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 my family pushed me. Okay. It was a war time and, and, and people never knew where they're going to end up in life. Mm -hmm. You know, the, every border changed and everybody got killed. And I mean, it's a very different world than it is now. Yeah. It's very hard for you to put yourself in a mindset of a parent, uh, of a kid from Hungary with a Jewish background in 1946-47. So I had no choice. I was told that, and plus my uncle who brought me here, Nick Monk, who was here, uh, my grandfather made him come out here. And uh, he uh, had a great engineering enterprise here, producing radar components. Uh, highly high precision radar components during the war. So there was no doubt that okay. I. So it was already a bit in the family. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't exactly me saying I <laughs> died to become an engineer. But as a, as a child or a teenager or, or up until you went to school for engineering, did you 
have any interest at all or or um, or, or like uh, some form of sciences as a kid or, or no not really <laughs> more and more in partisan good looking girls and <laughs> dating and <laughs> I must I'd be lying if I told you that I so was staying at home engineering geology uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because engineering is not the department with the most ladies. <laughs> no, <laughs> I wasn't given that choice. I told you. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a single woman in my class. Mm -hmm. Not one. Yeah. Wow. That doesn't surprise me. Only in those days? No. Especially in engineering. Especially in engineering. Yeah. And uh, right, after, right after school, what would uh, you say? What my would first you say job was, first was uh, job I'm was? an electronic, uh, so electrical engineering was between two in those days, electronics and electrical. Uh, electrical meaning power, electronics meaning uh, more communications. So I was into uh, electronics. I went to work for Canadian National Telegraph as a telegram engineer. I wasn't very good, I was bored. Uh, from there I went to Atlas Radio, which was a big importer of radio components. Uh, from the U.S. and Germany, and then I went on my own. Started off uh, Clareton, mm -hmm. which was in those days also a bit of a technological breakthrough, because the tubes, radio tubes, were just about to re be replaced by transistors, which of course gave a whole different approach to the design of a consumer product called radio, because it didn't have the heat. And nor the space, so yeah. so that came Clareton, uh, which became a, a bit of a Canadian success story, mm -hmm. uh, and it failed when it moved to Nova Scotia. But by that time, it was quite a big company, public. Yeah, it it, uh, it was famous with uh, quite a few famous people. Yeah, yeah, yeah with. Um, it was a uh, the BlackBerry of the days. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the Frank Sinatra's, the Frank Sinatra's, the Peter, yeah, Peterson, Oscar Peterson, Peter, yeah. Oscar Peterson, Louis Armstrong, they all had. Yeah. Uh, we just saw the other day a movie called The Graduate. Yes. In the background you see a Canadian, and people couldn't believe that you could make a high-tech product in those days. I said, well, you make it. I said, Canada, Canada. Because in those days, Canada was more like grain or wheat or forestry or or timber or plywood, but you, they couldn't believe that something that sold for five, six hundred dollars uh, at places like Bloomingdale's or Macy's could be a Canadian product. It just was out of the perception. Yeah. And and was it um, kind of revolutionary because it's, of the trend? It's a bit of a. It uses. Also, we had a, we were new. We were not RCA Victor. We were not, you know, the General Electric. So, you know, when you're starting from a basement, you get a bit more freedom than your yeah. sixth generation engineer in the radio department of General Electric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with your design. Your designs were... The but that was all. Mm -hmm. The designs were made possible by the change in the electronic composition. Mm -hmm. okay. But that was not much about mining. No, uh, not much, but, <laughs> but it's funny, funny enough. I Part have, of uh, my background and yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have... Um, one of the curators at the museum, he's the communications curator. He asked me. He was just like, "Oh, I hear you're interviewing uh, yeah. Peter Monk, and he wanted to the Clareton story, a bit of information." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he he he's loves that uh, yeah. all that stuff. But uh, but after that, um, then you move more into the hotel and restoration. Yes, but I uh, got fired. <laughs> me and David Gilmore because we moved from tele from from stereos and. I fi we moved to Nova Scotia. They were taken by government grants. Pictou County was underwater, and the federal government uh, was just at that time feeling its way, way to how to help federally in underdeveloped or, or hard hit areas economically. Pictou County was shipbuilding and coal mining. Both were wiped out after the boom years of the war. And so they were very keen, plus a very influential person in Nova Scotia and throughout Canada was Frank Sobey uh, from Sobey Stores, mm -hmm. yeah. who accumulated the biggest wealth 
in Pictou County. And so he was very close to the cabinet, the government of Mr. Stanfield, who had a very strong influence in Ottawa. And so we were attracted by a great offer to move our whole operation, furniture making, electronics, into an integrated operation in uh, New Glasgow, Victor County. Mm -hmm. And then we defaulted on the bond payments because we had strikes and we had all kinds of issues. I got fired, and to get a year's salary, I had to sign an agreement not to compete with the province. So I had to look for something new, and we had a small investment, David Gilmour and I, in the, in the Pacific, and from there we turned that. Uh, we, we became quite good in business. When you start with the basement, you had to become uh, good. Efficient. Uh, yeah, you really had to. I mean, you know, you can always delegate the, the technological part to engineers better than you. When it came to business, though, the maneuvering of the governments and the grants and the finances, it became more us and became more our specialty. And we were able to apply that to the hotel industry and we've done quite well. And so we built up a great hotel group starting from Fiji, Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand called Southern Pacific Hotel Corporation, which we sold out because by that time I had children and I did not want to go through what I've gone through, not to have a proper home and come to Canada when they're uh, ready to go to college. I wanted to grow up in Canada and have an infrastructure of friends and, and, and contacts. Yeah, I like feel it. at home here. Yeah. And I had five kids, so I came back, sold out and came back uh, with the money we made and uh, started, uh, moved into natural resources. Oil was our first investment. Quickly got wiped out in oil. What year? Uh, 79. Okay. Everybody said oil would go to 100 bucks. It didn't. We lost quite a bit of money. And then I moved quickly into mining, which was very related. I had a good board. I had some good fellow and joint investors with me, Canadian institutions, Guardian Capital, Joe Rotman, who started off the Rotman School afterwards. And um, uh, we, we, we got really lucky in a gold mining area. We teamed up with good people along the way. Uh, we got some lucky breaks, and that became then the genesis uh, of Barrick Gold. Because you were the you were the initial founder of, of Barrick Gold. So had you invested in gold already? No. How did, how did that work? In Barrick, which we created to be the holding company, and they put the money we got from the sale of the hotel group. When I came back, we had an investment company in Toronto, and we looked for natural resources. Our first investment was in oil and gas in Calgary. We got wiped out because of gold. the oil price went down mm -hmm. instead of up. And then with the remaining money, we said, let's go into gold uh, and gold mining. And uh, we made our first investment in Northern Ontario, a small amount, and then we went on from there, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and Barrick, uh, I mean, Barrick became the largest gold corporation in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, quite impressive. Where, um, where were all those these um, gold mines? So northern, you started with northern, northern Ontario. Northern Ontario, Wawa. What else? The next one we bought a company called Camflow, which was a well-known Canadian public company. Uh, which went into default on their debt because they diversified from the Malarctic region in uh, Quebec, in Val d'Or, and the Ontario-Quebec border, which they had a great mine, the Camflo mine, and they diversified from there into coal, oil, and thermal energy, all of which collapsed. They couldn't pay back their bank. Uh, the bank came to us and said, we need somebody to rescue the company. We need, I think, 100 million equity. 
which we put up. Uh, the bank gave us control of the company, and then we merged Camflow into Barrick, and we ended up with a fabulous team of Camflow mining executives. Bob Smith, Alan Hill, Dr. Miko, all second, third generation Canadian miners, totally experienced, absolutely competent in their field, outstanding, I would say, in metallurgy, in geology, in geotechnology, in, in mining per se, mining management. And I really, my job was really to run the business part. And we really formed a very successful cooperation between the miners who I totally trusted and the miners who trusted me uh, with business. And that really was the foundation of Barrick's success. So we merged Barrick and Camflow, uh, called this Camflow, I uh, called it Barrick Gold. Or maybe a, then they bought uh, a big Texas, the oil companies were falling on hard time. They, in the good days, when oil went from $9 to 60 or 70, they diversified and they went to mining. Now they had to tighten the belt, so they kept on selling the mines. We bought all the Texas mining as Texaco mining assets in White Plains and Bob Smith with him bringing his Canadian technology from a big company, oil company, management, which was bureaucratic, large, didn't know a damn thing about mining. Just every time we bought a mine, doubled the production, half the overhead, and uh, we became a bit of a stock market darling. Once you're a stock market uh, attraction, you had the currency to buy more things. So we bought uh, Homestake, which was one of the oldest American gold companies with deposits in California, Nevada. Then we bought Gold Strike, the, uh, the mineral deposits in the middle of Nevada. Uh, and then we bought Lac Minerals, and we did some 14 acquisitions. Because with each and every acquisition, our stock went up. Stock gave us a currency. And Bob kept on exercise, Bob Smith, our president, exercised his magic with a great team of miners, bought the Canadian knowledge, know-how, morality, management competence, geological competence, metallurgical know-how, into bear on all the mines, and in every single time, in every single way, uh, they improved the performance, which the market loved. And they became, within 10 years, the most profitable gold mining company in the world, far from being the biggest. And then we did two big acquisitions. One was Lakeshore Lack Minerals, the old Lakeshore Lack Mineral uh, Gold Mines in Ontario, who at that time controlled the Latin American big copper and gold belt in Argentina called El Indio. That was Sir Harry Oaks Lakeshore that became, through his, son, through his broker's son in law, uh, Peter Allen Lack Minerals. And then we did our biggest acquisition that made us the biggest in the world, which was the combined Placidome mines, called Placidome, which was by far the Canadian, Canada's largest coal mining operation. I think probably that time third in the world. And once we bought them, which at that time was the largest Canadian mining acquisition, we became the world's biggest. Okay, wow. And, uh you, you acquired many companies and many mines. Uh, other than gold, were there other minerals? Uh, yes, uh, we, we had copper. Yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, where I screwed up at the end, uh, which caused now all the problems uh, at the time when the gold price collapsed two years ago, uh, we tried to buy a company called Freeport uh, that also had gold, so it would have been a perfect combination. We had many meetings and discussions with their top shareholders, and some or others always did not work out. So we bought another mining company, copper mining company, to expand our, our we didn't want to have all our eggs in one basket. There's a danger to it that, after all, mining depends on the commodity price, commodity by definition is cyclical. So you want to even add the cycle 
uh, when we have a company of 50 billion dollar market cap. I mean, it was a monster of a company uh, two, three years ago. I think the third or fourth largest outside the bank, banks, uh, just in 25 years. So it was a good stuff. And so we made this big acquisition uh, of, uh, let's say, I guess an American company called Equinox that had nothing but copper in Saudi Arabia, in Tanzania. Uh, and by that time, Placer Dome already had some copper, so we had we were in copper in uh, Chile. Mm. Uh, so we, did, we created a, uh, a copper division. And in fact, the Equinox uh, acquisition, instead of what we usually had done, using our shares to buy, uh, because the debt market interest rates went down from 10 to 7 to 6 to 5. And we borrowed the money for the whole acquisition, which was, I think, 7 or 7 and billion. Uh, our bankers kept on saying, why would you use your equity? Uh, we can give you the money tomorrow. You just sell bonds globally in America and Canada. Huge demand for gold bonds. Gold was selling at 1600 or 1700 uh, and they give you uh, money at three percent and we were paying at that time our profits were i guess four four and a half billion after full tax so if you can borrow money and write the three percent off taxation the real cost to you is only two percent so why wouldn't you borrow two percent if you can make money two percent uh, uh, in a copper business you should have bought the company so who thought the copper with gold and all the commodities will go from copper went from five to three, uh, which pipes out all your profitability and cash flow. So that's uh, where we made a mistake. But you know, you can't look back and you can't build a company from zero to a global leader, particularly not in Canada, which is somehow rather not create doesn't create many global leaders I don't know why because we are I think the best in so many areas we certainly are recognized for our ethics our integrity uh, our honesty our, our the competence of our banking the reliability of our currency but somehow rather you know whether it's Nortel or whether it's uh, Abro or whether it's every time when we creating sort of a global genius I mean, the goddamn Dutch, a tiny little country, they got six globes, they're the Philips light bulbs, and they, wherever you look, the British, the Swiss, I mean, you look at the goddamn chocolate business, you look at the pharmaceutical <laughs> business, yeah. and there's seven million Swiss. Yeah. Metal business. And metal, I mean, look Barcelona at what they can do. Yeah, there's not, yeah, I mean, they just, I don't know, I mean, even Blackberry, for God's sakes, I thought, it's just unbelievable. It's just, I don't know. And nobody's better than we are. I mean, I, maybe I'm prejudiced. <laughs> I keep on making speeches about that. But somehow or other, there's, you know, even Seagram's, I mean, we dominated the whiskey yeah. business. But in anything, it doesn't matter what happens. Olympia York, I mean, they were, I don't know if you remember that, in real estate. It was in the Reichmans, the biggest bankruptcy in Canada. The two Reichman brothers, Olympia Canary oh. Wharf. Yeah. They owned everything. They own Trazak, and they own Bramley, and they own the shopping malls. They own Canary Wharf. Hmm. Disappeared. Kind of like Fairview. I mean, these were huge, huge, leading global companies. Anyway, I'm not complaining. <laughs> we'll get it back, but yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. Okay. A, a bit of a change of, of uh, subject here. Would, if I were to ask you, um, who was your greatest mentor? Would you have one, and who would that be? I did, but it wouldn't mean much to you, uh, because it was in Clareton days when okay. I was my, at the very beginning of my independent business career. I mean, to go public was such an unheard of thing coming from Europe. I mean, uh, after the war, there were immigrants like me taking a stock of an unknown product called Clareton and going to the Toronto Stock Exchange. I mean, I couldn't. I had a man who was one of our main, very established American electronic component supplier, uh, who had a chairman by the name of Monty Shapiro. 
Mount in New York, Mount Desert, you know. He was the chairman of General, General Instruments, which was a huge electronic American company. And they supplied me with a, a very key transistorized component that was very unknown in Canada. Uh, Rogers gave me the tubes. That's how Ted and I became friendly. But as I told you, we quickly switched from tubes because we just hit the radio business at a transition point and after 50 years of radio tubes and vacuum tubes, they switched to transistors. And by the way, in, in the electronic world, was Claritone one of the first to use transistors? The first. The first, okay. Mm -hmm. That's another key to your success, okay. So I would call Monty was an enormous influence on me. In mining and mining, well, of course, Bob Smith. Yeah, you had mentioned him. I mean, he was my God, my partner, my confidant, my, the person I spoke to every day five times. I was very lucky. I, I created some excellent relationships from my school days, from Clareton, my lawyers, my bankers. You know, I guess I never harmed anybody. I tried to share the wealth. I, I have certain principles about stock options and having everybody in the company when, you, when the, you know, the owners get wealthy, that everybody should share that wealth and be created from the switchboard on millionaires when the stock was split every year twice, three times, back in the 80s and 90s, and Barrick was consistently the best performing stock. And all those people operated on options. And for the joy to see those guys who worked their guts out get the benefit of, of, of the goodies. And so when I moved from Clareton to Barrick, I had with me a bunch of really loyal people, decent, who supported me and helped me. And did you um, join any organizations throughout your career? Organizations I'm not a big committees? One. No? I'm not a big one. I didn't like going to conventions, not to mining conventions, not to electronic conventions, not to real estate. You know, I own Trizac. I sold some in my company. I sold some bag shares. I just thought to be that dependent on gold was not healthy. So I had a few original shareholders whose interest I had to work for, and uh, including my own. And so I diversified sometimes in the middle of the bank program into real estate. Uh, real estate went down, whatever it was. Trizac was the leading Canadian real estate company. And Bromfels and the Reichmans owned it. It was in the hand of the bank. And so we put up a large amount of money, like a half a billion cash. And we converted the international debt structure into shares which they said they were ready to do with somebody credible putting up equity. So uh, I, I, I carried with me all the sort of people who, who, who accountants, bankers. I, 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 it wasn't so much an association. It was a matter of applying sort of what were my business philosophies of, of you know, doing it the right way, of focusing, of, 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 of sharing the risks, of, of, you know, not trying to be greedy, of, of you know, all the things that I applied when I spent my first $2,000 uh, in a Clareton set, uh, when I built the first one in the basement. I mean, you know, it just seemed to work then, and it worked ever since. The scale may be different, but the principles remain the same. It's, I never went to a business school. Yeah, true. So you, you didn't see, a, you never saw an interest or, or a need really in joining in an organization. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't, uh, an, I wasn't the, the, the best electronic engineer in Clareton. We had people 10 times smarter than me. And in school, I didn't even take uh, uh, transistors yet. It was, we were still all vacuum tube. In the, in the 40s and 50s. So what the hell did I know about? But they were dumb and we could hire them. They were great people and you gave them a platform. Why would I compete with that knowledge and 
a bit of knowledge is sometimes very harmful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, mining, I mean, that really, for me to go to a mine would have been dangerous. I mean, I, uh, they always invited me and I cut ribbons. Also in the hotel business, I mean, how did I, uh, you know, I, I applied the business principles. I probably provided some leadership to people who believed in me or believed in the common objective of winning and, and being uh, number one, if you can get there, and it's fun. And get the rewards fairly shared. And, um, I mean, I know you, you were a busy man, but uh, were there any social activities um, with work or outside of work that go to social activities? Listen, my, my of course, I mean, I, I love my friends and I love my family and I love skiing and I love my island up north and all the things normal Canadians like and do. Uh, but having said that, I'm, I was quite focused. I was working hard. I also like to take off my long weekends on my island. I had an island 50 years in Georgian Bay. I never missed a summer. I skied 71 consecutive seasons. Very few people have ever done that. I never missed 71 years when I gave up two years ago. Downhill? Downhill, yeah. What, uh, what's, what's the best mountain you've ever skied? Um, uh, Canadian mountain holidays. The helicopter skiing in Alberta and Revelstoke. And Bagaboos, you should be. <laughs> uh, I've done some really exciting stuff yeah. in Greenland, in Iceland, mm. with crazy helicopter tours. In France, I did the Grand Tour uh, from Chamonix. No, we did some, and my wife is a top, top, top skier. So we met skiing, we've been married 40 odd years. Our kids are, every one of them. Uh, my son Anthony was at Queens, captain of the ski team. My daughter Nina was at Smith College, captain of the ski team. My daughter Natalie was captain of her ski team because they all grew up following their mother at age Steve, two, three, yeah. four, uh, in powder and rocks and between trees. Nice. Uh, good stuff. Yeah, I'm a huge skier. That's Are cool. you? That's, yeah, that's why but I am. There's no sport like it. I love it. There's no sport like it. The rush it. you get. Oh, and you wait until you got kids, your family, your friends, it ties you together. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. there's nothing like it. Yeah. A football game, so. You, you know, an hour and you run around in the dust. But I mean, to be exposed to mountains yeah, between true. the sky and the snow mm -hmm. and to see the landscape. I mean, I could show you photographs. They could be all postcards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah for sure. Right on. Um, I mean, you've done a lot of different jobs in a lot of different settings, but um, how uh, present and or absent uh, were women in the workplace? Or if so, what were, what were their roles? You talking about my relationship to women, or are you talking about? No, no, uh, professionally. Like, um, in the, have you seen? That was not one of my issues. No. I mean, I know it's a modern, I see it from my children, and I know that the mandating women on boards, engineering is not, nor mining, was not traditionally the professionals where women would have excelled, mm -hmm. nor would women be very interested. I mean, there were a hundred other fields, like, you know, in my foundations and my philanthropic activity, you know, I'm, you know, I did, uh, you know, I spent decades, and I am, the cardiac center in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I founded it, and I provided the initial funding, and I still do. Of course, it's an enormous amount of women. Uh, in university, I, I, I gave the money for the Monk Global School at the U of T, where I spent five years and I graduated from, and the Monk Center, it's all women. But in mining? Not so much. Not so much. But now, in the last few years, I see quite a few, um, and they're very good, but on the mines, it's not a kind of job that attracts women. So I'm, it's not a subject yeah, I'm not, aware of, no. Yeah, not, uh, not many. No, no, really. And I'm, so, so this is not an issue. And can you talk a bit about a bit more about your uh, philanthropic work? So, sure. I mean, I, I, I uh, probably, you, you, you heard it or you read it, I, I, I have an enormous debt to be repaid to, 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 to our country. 
and I have to also be in love with the country. So, A, I love it, and when you love something, whether it's a woman or a sport, you spend time or money on it. Uh, <laughs> and I love the country of both, yeah. And B, I, in contrast to you, most likely, or well, my friends, I mean, I, 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 my family did not contribute building this country. Your family probably has. Uh, and Bob Smith's grandfather died, and my partner David Gilmore's grandfather and father risked his life for this country. We got the benefits. We didn't pay the price. And I think that yet, you know, we, you guys, the country is so magnificent, and that's why Canada is Canada. I mean, you guys willingly share. You do not say, hey, hold on, you came from um, Europe. What the hell did your family do? Uh, you know, we are, we are privileged. It's the opposite. I mean, look, I got the highest mm. definition out of Canada. I never been, I, I never been excluded from anywhere. I never felt socially or, or academically or commercially or business-wise anything but total full acceptance and inclusiveness based on the contribution I can make as a human being. Not what my father and grandfather was. It's a country where they don't ask you where you come from, they ask you where you're going. Yeah, where you're going, what can you do? And uh, what can you do for the country. And, and so I have a huge obligation. And so very early I said to my children, every single Christmas when we got together that, you know, I'm an entrepreneur now and, you know, I may die as a very wealthy man or I may be at a... All I can do for you is what my parents have done for me. Give you a set of values. Teach you what human relations, integrity, honesty represents and how important they are. Uh, and give you the freedom and the ability by providing you with an education to choose what you'd like to do. Would you like to be a carpenter? Be an excellent carpenter. You want to be a ski guide? I got very many friends who, who, whose kids said, hey, we don't want to have this rat race in Bay Street. Oh, give us a break. Who needs that? We'll go out and get settled in Revelstoke and become a guide and ski. And I respect that. And that should be a choice for the kids. And I don't want to screw them up by saying, you know, I'm worth 100 million bucks and each of you will get, well, what kind of a joy? Where is the sense of achievement? Money is just a symbolism. It's a token of that we created a society to recognize your success. What else do you know? Not everybody can get an order of Canada. I mean, you know, you can get an order of Canada for being a good fisherman or a great teacher. Money is some reward given in the commercial field. Ah, to me, for me to hand that 20 million over to my kid, who may be a drug addict, or maybe a bit of an asshole. Ah, but, you know, it doesn't do much for the kid, doesn't do much for me. It's much better to say that, you know, uh, I'll give you the education, I'll give you the set of values, I'll give you everything to tell you what made me happy, what made me successful, and what made me a very satisfied human being when I finally go to my grave. That's what life is all about. Uh, and whether I end up with $10 million, $1 million, $100,000, or $100 million, it's not really important. Therefore, the money that I make should really go back to where the money came from, which is society. Mm. But particularly in my case, which I said to you earlier, I have this enormous feeling of debt. And you know, it's absolutely normal that when you go through life and your early period, when you really are dependent on other people because you haven't yet developed your self-confidence. The people who contain those are, are a source where you only get things from. At one point, I don't care what kind of human being you are, at one point you say, hey, time has come for me to pay back. If I got that much from you, some people will come to the conclusion earlier, some pe people will come to this later, but at one point, you have a normal desire to reciprocate. I got so much 
I mean, my grandfather, age 90, couldn't, couldn't speak English. Who looked after them? The Toronto Hospital. Why? Why? There's no country where, I mean, it's just, my father came here, my mother came here, they all buried in the Mount Pleasant term. And my, my father was Jewish in the Jewish cemetery. I mean, I mean, they, they done, they, they just, they were given everything by your country. Security, comfort, inclusiveness, a home, free health care, education for their kids. Well, I made it. It's not time for me to repay the country. So to me, my foundation became really of prime importance. And because I believe in focus, I just don't think that you achieve much in life with the limited capabilities we all have, unless you focus that capability on the issues that are of prime importance to you, i.e. you prioritize your objectives. The same thing was true for philanthropy, and that's why I gave a large amount of money to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you see the Peter Monk Cardiac Center, that in Toronto today is the number one in Canada today. It has the most complex cases, has the largest cases, heart transplants, valve transplants. In every respect, all the complex cases get reversed there. We have huge research facilities. It's, uh, and in uh, the scholastic field, I've done that for the University of Toronto and established the Monk School of Global Affairs. And then School I of Global, global Affairs. Global Affairs, yeah, on yeah. Bruce Street. Yeah. yeah. So, and then we have a third foundation, uh, which is Public Affairs. So we support some 40, uh, 40 think tanks, from Halifax to Vancouver, where intellectuals, academics, decide to do studies that can be helpful for Canada to form its governmental or opposition policies. Mm -hmm. And they are think tanks, and they, we have a board, board, they apply to it. We also have an institution called the Monk Debates. Check it on your website. Mm -hmm. uh, superb. Every six months, the Monk Debates are held in Toronto, thousands of people, it's all across the world in television. Every debate is published, the book is published afterwards. We've done dozens of them. Are yeah, the for about, instance, about any? Uh, about every every debate is a different subject. Last one was about should Russia be inclusively handled or should be punished. The last one, we had one uh, on the importance of religion. Uh, we had one on the importance of U.S. Canadian relations. We had one on Europe. Interesting. So they bring in people like Kissinger, uh, like Tony Blair. Watch it. I will. I love the debates. It's every, you, yeah, it's yeah. fun. We are our best in Canada, I hate to say that. Okay. The, they, they just been announced that on September 25th, the Monk debates will host the leadership debates on economics between Harper, Trudeau, and, oh. and the Monk there. <laughs> and that's Neat. not a thing for a private, yeah. and that was funded by me. I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah, please. I will. I will. Monk debates, <laughs> September 25th. Go on to your web. I will, I will. Uh, I know, yeah, I know you don't have a... you got 10 minutes. Okay, um, I'll, I'll finish with two questions. Then. Thank you. And this one's, uh, I guess it could be tough, but I can divide it in two. What, uh, what is your proudest moment in life? And I can divide it, we could go, what is your proudest moment in life? And then what is your proudest moment professionally? Or proudest... My proudest moment in life, I think. <laughs> there were quite a few when I did the bugger boots with all my kids, and we were so good, we were dropped up by helicopter, that the bugger boot at CMH had a, a picture taken as a helicopter left, and this whole huge valley, and I wish I could show you a picture, uh, they were uh, our guide, my Swiss ski guide who I invited as a guest, my wife, and the five kids. So, so, and they were entirely the monk family. And I was uh, either 80 or 79. At that time, the oldest guest at CH, CHM, Canadian Mountain, C CMH. Yes. And uh, so from a personal achievement point of view, that made yeah. me great, I'm very happy. Uh, really proud. Um, but I was given the highest order of Canada. I mean, also when I got the first one, 
companion of the uh, I got a couple, order. yeah, and there are only 300 of them living, and I couldn't believe that. Well, well I got many uh, since then honorary degrees, but when I got that letter uh, in February from the U of T that I'll be given, I could, I could barely pass. And it's not because my English wasn't good, I could use that. It's an excuse. That'd be BS. The reality was that I wasn't smart enough, or I wasn't diligent enough, or I, whatever I wasn't. I did manage, I got my degree. But to be asked at the University of Toronto to get an honorary degree, doctorate, I, I, I remember crying. And I don't cry very often. And the last uh, moment was when uh, I think we became, uh, in 2012, we announced our profits for the year before, after having paid full tax, with zero government support or grants, so we're not Bombardier, or we're not one of these companies that continue to rely on the government, we never got a dollar. We showed the highest after-tax profit of a commercial activity. We showed four and a half billion dollars after tax. And I created it, I started it, and I thought. So those were probably the four highlights of the last 30 years, which made me happy Good. and proud. Yeah. Good answers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so we'll finish with uh, one last question, probably my favorite. Uh, if you were to speak to someone much younger or uh, than, uh, students or, or, or someone like that, what would be the most important life lesson or piece of advice you could give them? I, I guess, I guess, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I mean, I presume you're asking me advice how to become successful. Uh, successful or, or, or happy and successful. Um, that's really? a better question. <laughs> yeah. You you Fulfill. can't you can't you can't happy successful is a much better because you can be successful in business and you can become a billionaire by trading shares or speculating. I don't know what you contribute in, to yourself when you speculate and I mean I got a, somebody I know quite well who's very famous and who made I don't know billions of dollars and uh, his name is George Soros and he broke the Bank of England. Well, it's not much different, and he was brilliant. I mean, to bet against billions against the pound, and the pound have you heard of George Soros? No. Well, the richest man in America. Okay. But he broke the Bank of England. Soros, S-O-R-O-S, check it on your okay. Google. George Soros. He's known to have broken the Bank of England when the British pound collapsed some 20 years ago. And that's one way to make money. But, but that's no different than you go to a casino <laughs> and you put, let's say you're rich and you put $100,000, if they were to allow you, on a number and the number comes out. I mean, he could have been right, he could have been wrong. So money per se is only really contributes to your sense of who you are, the sense of creating that inner self-confidence that makes you happy, I as a fulfilled human being, if you look at money as a reward of your achievement, it's an acknowledgement, like the Order of Canada. What the hell is the Order of Canada worth? I got a buck for it in the street corner. It's priceless. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's, it represents an exceptional achievement, if you know what it is. That's how you got to look at money. And what matters to you is your achievement. The set of achievements doesn't make you happy. And you've got to get that in your mind, that you've got to focus on something where, and I don't care if you are a great carpenter, or a great fisherman, or a great creator, or just a plain businessman, which is really what I am. I mean, I'm not a miner. I, I didn't become the biggest gold miner because I'm the best miner. I didn't even go to mining school. As I told you earlier, I didn't even go to a mining association. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even know about geology. I mean, yet, look what I've done. So, and, and, and so, A, 
you can look at money purely as a result and as a symbolism of your achievement. Whatever field, medical, scientific, business. And then the second part of that, which is equally important, that after you did get your reward, which is money in our society for having excelled in a field you prioritized or you chosen, then what do you do with the money? It's not enough to make it. What really makes you a fulfilled human being when you reach 85 and 88, which I am, is to look at the second side and say, I made it, but I didn't just hoard it. I just didn't put it into uh, diamonds. I created schools. I created public debates. I raised the awareness you shared of Canadian intellectuals. I shared it. So what you do with it, and the totality of that, I think if you do the achievement part well, and you do the second part well, what you do with the money, I think that then you can go lean back at the end of your life and say, wow, you know, I think I've done it. You can't do better in life than that. Well, Mr. Muck, thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for your time. My pleasure.